simply want to say again, welcome all and good morning to everybody. And it's so good to be here with all of you today. Uh, I'm going to ask a question today. How many of you have ever been confused by something in life? Raise your hand. If you've ever been confused by something in life, you might have been confused this morning. You might have been confused just a minute ago. I really don't know. Uh, it can happen to the best of us. Uh, and so in researching this question, I was looking up the, you know, some of the top things that confuse most people. So I hope you're ready for this. And I hope you kind of chuckle at a few of these things, okay? But some of the top things that confuse most people in the whole world. Some of these I found really interesting that I would maybe not be confused by, but I'm going to go for it, okay? Number one is daily mass. How many of you are confused by daily mass? Okay? All right. So I think it's more than two plus two equals four. Uh, I'm talking about like equationic math, like x plus y plus z plus x plus y plus y squared plus z plus a plus b plus 7 plus 9 plus times 2 times 2,000 into a million divided by 2 times x times z. You guys with me? Okay. I'm confused. I don't even know the answer to my own math question. Okay. Next thing. Uh, how many of you have ever seen a picture of the Mona Lisa? Okay. Very famous painting, the Mona Lisa. Okay. Um, in it, one of the most confusing things in the world is the way she smiles. Okay. This has been a great mystery and debate for hundreds of years is, is how she smiles. I mean, is she actually smiling or is she plotting your death? You don't know. You don't know. All right. Next thing that confuses most people is a thing called the Bermuda Triangle. How many of you ever heard of the Bermuda Triangle? Okay. It's a place down south of here, way south of here. Okay. It's not in Indiana, just, just to calm your fears. Okay. Um, but the Bermuda Triangle is this place that airplanes have gone through and disappeared or come out in a weird way on the other side somehow, lost track of time. You know, aliens, UFOs, and the 37th dimension all live there too, just for, you know, those of you who don't know. But the Bermuda Triangle is confusing to most people because most people believe that their lost socks have somehow ended up in the Bermuda Triangle. And that is confusing when you only have one sock that matches. <laughs> okay, that's confusing. Uh, another thing that confuses most people, and this confuses me as well, um, how many of you have ever heard, there's a group, it's a family, but it's mainly it's a group of women, they're called the Kardashians, okay? Uh, most people are confused as to how they even got famous, because nobody knows how they even got famous. I don't know how they got famous. <laughs> it's confusing, isn't it? Um, and last but not least, one of, one of the things that's most confusing is this. Um, how many of you have a cell phone? Okay. All right. Most of you do. Okay. And how many of you text message? Okay. Text message. Okay. Um, if you have a smartphone, your phone will sometimes want to take control and do this thing called predictive texting. Okay. How many of you have ever been confused when you type something in a text and what you typed did not come out the way that you said that you wanted it to be. How many of you are confused? Yes. Okay. That's also the top five things that most people are confused on. Um, one of the most confusing things that people see today is Christians. It's Christians. Brennan Manning says this. He says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and they walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Today, there's so much confusion about what it is to be a Christian um, churches have tried to define it in all kinds of different ways. Um, you know, churches have tried to define a Christian by how you worship, the music that we use, the liturgy, which is 
you know, scriptures and readings and all these other things. Being a Christian has been defined sometimes by the rules that we have, such as the way we cut our hair, <laughs> or the way we don't cut our hair, or the way we kind of cut our hair. That's confusing. Sometimes being a Christian has been defined by what you wear. Sometimes being a Christian has been defined by how much water was used to get that sin out of your life when you went in the water to get baptized. You can laugh at that one. That's okay. All right. But the thing of it is, is in a society that's become extremely secular, we need to get to the point of really what it is. And it is to be called a Christian. In fact, the Apostle Peter, he sought this in 1 Peter chapter 2.21. This is what he said. He said, to this you were called. To this, to being a Christian because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. I think we sang a song about that this morning, didn't we? Where he leads, I'll follow. You didn't know you were going to about to sing some of the sermon here, did you? Okay. But the thing of it is, is sometimes suffering is a part of our following as much as it is dying out to ourselves. And we are more in our lives in a mode that we always want to stay comfortable. But being a Christian doesn't always huh, afford or even give us the luxury of the kind of comfort that we may want or even desire. But there is a certain kind of comfort that God does give to us that's different. And so I want us to be able to turn to our Bibles today. I want us to look at the words of the Master. His name is Jesus Christ. And this is what he spoke about in his word. And so today I want us to stand and I want us to begin to look at Luke chapter 10. We're going to look at verse 25 through 37. And as we turn to our Bibles, remember, this person who is telling this in this scripture is Jesus himself, who is our great master and savior. And so I'm hoping that the words that he is saying speak to your heart and speak about being a great example today. And so as we look at this parable that you may have read several times before, I'm praying that the Lord lead us deeper. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let's dig into the word of God today. This is what it says. It says in verse 25, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Huh. It's an interesting question, isn't it? What is written in the law? He replied. How do you read it? He answered. Jesus answered. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You know, you ever have those people in your life that you give them the right answer and no matter what they tell you, they want to have to argue with you about the right answer? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to read that again for those of you who need to pray for those individuals. But this is what he said. He said, and who is my neighbor? <laughs> so this is what Jesus said. Jesus said this. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when... He was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring an oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, 
he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Then the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And then Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Let's bow our heads today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you because, Lord, we, we want to be enriched by your word. And God, I ask for a transforming of hearts. I ask for a miraculous work within our lives. Lord, Lord, I just ask that you do what you need to do within this place, Lord, to unwrestle and unsettle some of the things that maybe we've just been letting it sit dormant within our hearts and minds, within, in the basement of our lives. So, Father, may this word... Speak to us today. Lord, use this preaching and teaching, Lord, today for your glory. And Lord, may the words that I say, Lord, anoint them, Lord, right now to be the words that you want to speak to your people. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You guys may be seated. Amen. So in Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells this story about a man who was attacked on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho. Now, some people were coming down the road and, and they seen that he had been robbed and they seen that he had been injured and they seen that he was in a desperate condition. Just real quick, how many of you have ever been stranded by the side of the road somewhere in your life? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, was that a fun thing for you? <laughs> okay, good. All right. So, we can kind of empathize and sympathize with this person. Now, in the story, the good Samaritan sees the man and he stops to help. And he goes beyond normal courtesy, even placing himself in danger. And Jesus, at the end of his story, says this. He says, we need to go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. We need to be the people who help if we're going to be doing what Jesus wants us to do. Amen? I'm going to ask that one more time. It's getting really quiet. We need to be the people who help if we're going to be doing what Jesus tells us that we need to be doing. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, in this story and in this passage, um, Jesus, actually, I'm sorry, I got my notes mixed up. I'm sorry, that happens. It's okay, right? Good. Uh, at the beginning of the book in Matthew, we see Jesus, and, and I believe it's, actually, it's in Luke chapter 4. We see Jesus saying this. So in Luke chapter 4, verse 18 through 19, this is what Jesus spoke about. He said this, he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed. What's that word? Free. Say that again. What was that word? Free. 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 Set the oppressed free. Okay, next verse. To do this. Say this with me. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. All right. So there is some debate because there's some Christians out there who think that if you can cut your hair a certain way, that you're in right with God. But they will say that Jesus wants nothing to do with love, grace, peace and mercy. And they believe that God is just angry at you all the time, ready to throw lightning bolts at you until you get your next haircut. That saves you. You never run into those people. I have. <laughs> they put more faith in what you wear what you look like, than they actually do in what God says. And that's dangerous. Because Jesus himself said this. He said that the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me and has sent me to preach the good news to who? The to the poor. And to do what? To proclaim release to the prisoners. To tell about recovery of the sight to the blind. To liberate the oppressed. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
This is what Jesus did for every single person in here today. Give God praise for that. Amen. Here our Lord said he was called to help people in need. <laughs> and he wouldn't call you into something that he himself did not call himself into. Amen? Amen. And if he was called to go, do you not think that we also are called to go as well? The same spirit that was upon the Lord Jesus when he said these words is also the same spirit that accompanies you and goes with you as you also proclaim that this day, <laughs> that this time, that this moment, you proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know why? Because Jesus is still in the business of setting people free from sin. He's still in the business of liberating those that have been oppressed. He's still in the business of giving love, grace, and peace and mercy to all who come to his table. Give God praise for that. Amen. The same spirit is upon you. Now the thing of it is, do you actually believe that this morning? Do you believe that? Yes. I want you to. Because I don't want you just to read it, and then you forget about it, and then you go on, and then the Lord presents an opportunity to you. So, I want us to also look here today at another piece of scripture. It's in the book of Matthew, and it's also in chapter 25. And this is verses 31 through 46. Again, Jesus is speaking this. I didn't write this. I didn't edit this. This is what the Lord said. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. Amen? Amen. Okay, you're with me. All right. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left. Then the king will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then he says this. This is what's interesting. He says, for I was hungry. And you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. And you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger. And you invited me in. I needed clothes. And you clothed me. I was sick. And you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you. Whatever you did for one of the least, for one of the least, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't even invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then, they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. At the end of this, Jesus makes the point, I think, extremely clear. He did not beat around the bush. <laughs> he did not give you the what's what about it. He told you. 
in a very clear and decisive way. One day we'll be judged. One day we'll be divided like sheep from goats. And the sheep, which are those who help ordinary people, who didn't know that they were helping at the time, but they didn't just acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but they let their actions and their lives demonstrate the love and grace and compassion and mercy of Jesus. Those are the ones that have access into heaven. And then he says, those who don't are like goats. And they go to a place that I wish for nobody in this place. They go to a place of eternal punishment. And eternal punishment is complete separation from God. Complete separation from hope. Complete separation from getting a redo. Complete separation from love. Grace and mercy of God. Complete separation. And so it's clear. I believe <laughs> that we are called to be a good Samaritan church. Amen? Amen. And that's where the title for the message comes from. A good Samaritan church. What does that look like? What does that mean? It means being a good Samaritan to those around us. It's very simple. It is not a complicated rocket science kind of very theologically fueled sermon today. It's as basic as basic can get. Talk about loving people. Loving people. Loving people is one of the most important things that we can do for each other. And not just in the church. Yes, obviously, we love each other in the church, and we're there for each other in the church. You have brothers and sisters in the church here today. But what I'm talking about is loving people out there, loving people who in themselves have no love, loving people who are hard to love, loving people that no one else will love, loving people that are marginalized and different. Loving people right where they're at. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I have three, <laughs> three little points I'm going to talk about. My first point is this. The lack of love always leads to decline. <laughs> lack of love always leads to decline. Today, churches are declining quick. In all sorts of different ways. They're declining in membership, attendance, participation. You know, we're always looking on trying to figure out how we can reach people. How can we reach new generations? And how can we reach people that need the gospel so much within their lives? And how do we do that in a real and genuine and authentic way? I'm just going to simply say, like, in previous generations, you were kind of like, society told you you should probably go to church on Sunday, okay? How many of you remember that? You went because culture told you it was the thing you need to do on Sunday, okay? Um, we no longer live in that culture. And for some of you, um, you know that. But I'm just going to simply tell you, like, I don't have a line of people here at the end of the service, ready to come for next week's service, okay? I don't have a lot of people waiting here Saturday night ready to get in, okay? Boy, oh boy, would that be wonderful. <laughs> so if you don't have anything else to pray about, you can pray about that. But it, it's not like how it used to be, okay? People would go to church or be in a community of faith regularly, but, but we don't see that. And, and, and so the question is, well, why don't we see that? What's happening and, and, and there's blame here, and there's this, and well, this generation is this, and this generation is that. But here's the thing. You know, it doesn't matter about what generation you belong to. Every single person born on this planet needs love. Amen. Every single person born on this planet needs love. I don't care if you live in England, Indonesia, 
Russia, Ukraine, Antarctica, or on Pluto. <laughs> Every single human being needs love. And why is that? Well, it's because we were made to love. God made us to love him first and foremost. And then sin came in and broke that relationship and tainted it. And instead of loving God most, humans turn to love themselves the most. But here's the thing. If we don't have love, which is the most important ingredient in any sort of reaching and evangelism, of anything that we do, we really need to get before the Lord and ask if that's what He would really want us and how for us to be. Because I'm challenged here this morning. Are you challenged? Yes. I know I'm challenged myself. In churches, it's appropriate to think that, well, we'll fill the church if we just, just had this kind of worship style, just this kind of pastor, this kind of thing or that. But here's the thing. That doesn't bring people. What brings people in the church is when you reach out and love them for where they're at. That's what brings them in. And that's the kind of church I believe that honors God. Amen? Amen. 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 So that was my first point. Like a love leads to decline. The next point is this. If a lack of love leads to decline, I believe by what we read today, will help us. Because my second point is this. Helping hurt people leads to looking more like Jesus. Helping hurt people leads to looking more like Jesus. Jesus said <laughs> that what will work in building his kingdom where he's going, we follow. You know what works? It's learning how to love people and learning how to help people where they hurt. Okay? Now, what does this mean? It means that sometimes as we approach people, we, we almost have to pray and ask, Lord, what are some of the things that this person is struggling with or what, what do they need? That somehow, in a small way, maybe I can contribute a seed or plant something within their life. Be there for them. How, how can you use me, Lord, to work? Okay? And so needs-based evangelism is being sensitive and it's being caring. And it's all about helping people where they're at. I'm going to kind of tell you some of the evangelism that's happened to me and why it was not effective. Can I, can I tell you that from that point of view? Here's what doesn't work. If you just leave a track and tell someone that they're a dirty, rotten sinner and they're going to hell, that's not going to work. <laughs> you know how many of those I've gotten in my life? And I've been like, what is this all about? And that's how they leave it. They don't even leave it saying God loves you or anything. Like, it's just you're going to hell. That is not an encouraging message. But that should prompt us in understanding that we understand the scriptures. We know what Jesus said. But my thing is, I don't want anybody to perish. Not on my watch. And so, I want to take that, and I'm not taking away from the truth of that, but I'm going to add to that and say, God, then how can you use me to speak to these individuals within my life? Something else that doesn't quite work is just being pushy about certain things. You need to let God do the working and moving. And here's what I mean by pushy. I, I've known, and I've told people I'm a Christian, but then I'll have other Christians try to Christianize me into being an other Christian, or like a Baptist or something like that, or, uh, or a you know Catholic or something like you know. They always try to. Uh, and, and so what I mean by that is sometimes we just got to let God have His space to let people to let Him work with people. Amen. 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 So those are some of the things that I know that, that they didn't quite work with me, but, but here's what does work is when you be able when you begin to pray for someone, 
and, and you can see that there's a need in their life, and you pray, Lord, how can I help with that person's need? Ah, that helps open up some things. Because the greatest mistake that the church has ever made in recent years has not been noticing the hurts of the people on the side of the road that we encounter. We get so busy going to our meetings and activities that sometimes we don't even stop to see who's hurting on the side of the road. And the irony is that by that very act, the church is dying. Churches all across the world begin to grow and thrive when they become sensitive to the needs of the people that surround them. Because Jesus said that he came to help. Not to hinder, but to help. And he calls us as his followers that we must do the same. And yes, there's all kinds of techniques. There's all kinds of, you know, you could take seminars, and classes. You know, you could, you could go to Bible college like I do. <laughs> there's all kinds of ways that you can, you can get better at things. But, but the simple nugget of truth is this. What really works is when you just basically begin to love people more than you love yourself. Amen? Spending time with people, crying with people, offering them a hand to hold them up when they can't even get on their feet. What works is, is just reaching them where they're at, overlooking how people are dressed, or their background, or their beliefs, or their politics, giving them some dignity and respect, inviting someone in who, who maybe is, is dealing with a, a serious issue within their life, and just having a time of prayer and coffee. Because coffee always makes things better. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's caring enough to go to the hospital when the patient is undergoing some sort of treatment or surgery. It's, it's meeting their friends and family and getting to know people. It's inviting them in to your life. And that's so hard some, for some of us nowadays because we're so isolated. We just went through a period of isolation with COVID. But we're called to reach out and to break through those walls in one way or another, it's ministry. Give God praise that He wants you to be His angel. Amen. My last point is this, is that being a good Samaritan church is a church that's all about caring. And being a good Samaritan church to me is a church that is this. It's vibrant in the love of God. How many of you love the Lord today? Amen. Amen. Give Him praise. It's being vibrant and being obedient to what he speaks. And it's being understanding that the people that you may be needing to help may be a complete, total opposite of who you are. They may not even know God. They may not even like God. They may not even understand God. There's all of these sorts of things and situations. But God calls us to be his hands and feet to those who need it. And it's not about doing just like a little bit of good and we sprinkle it. Oh, that looks so nice. Look at that. It's so beautiful. Oh, my. Woo. A little bit of good here and there. No. no. It's always being intentional with our time and our resources. It's being intentional. And it should be as natural to us, hopefully, as sharing the latest and greatest movie that you've seen on Netflix. Or blockbuster video, if you still go to the video store. Um, it, it's, it should be hopefully as natural as like, man, I just went to this restaurant, you got to try it. Well, hopefully telling someone about the love and grace of God is just something natural. Listen, you don't have to be a preacher or a theologian to share the love of God. Yes. You just got to share it. And the way that God uniquely designed and made you to share that. It's about making our lives wrap around the life of who God is and understanding that God wants to work in this world and build his kingdom through people just like you and me. I mean, I would have never been in the church if someone hadn't decided 
in my neighborhood a long time ago that they were going to put a BBS program on. And I know you've heard this. I've probably said this almost every sermon. So I'm sorry. It's one more time. But I never would have been here if it wasn't for someone who decided we're going to go to this poor neighborhood and try to pick up some kids. We may not have any luck, but we're going to go try. And so they knocked on every single door. They handed out flyers. This is back in the 80s when some of that was still okay to do. Um, and, and so, you know, they, they, they did that. And, and I was like, yeah, I want to do that. Never in their minds would they think that I'd be here in the year 2022 preaching and teaching and talking about the Word of God to you fun folks here today. But they planted that seed. And then God watered that seed in my heart. And then I had to say at some point in my life, well, here I am, use me. It can be hard to love people. But you need love, don't you? <laughs> don't you? Yes. Okay, some of you said that, I, so I don't know. Now I, I maybe better understand, some of you just relate to the, <laughs> don't want love, my life, leave it alone. Everybody needs love. You need love, right? Yeah. Right. I need love too. And what more beautiful way than to be able to take the love that we have and share that with people all around us. Because people need love. More than anything today, you know, there's so many things that tear us apart. Social media tears us apart at times. Uh, politics, this, that. I mean, I, I don't want to even get into all that. I want to be about love. I want to be about bringing things together. Because God brought me together in my heart, within my life, within my mind, within my, my spirit. He put me together. And I want to be able to share what he's done with every person that I know. It can be hard to love people who have taken advantage of you. It can be hard to love people that you've tried to help a hundred times and here they are for the hundred and first time knocking at your door. And some, sometimes it's hard to help people because you just think that they're so ungodly they're not even worth your time. And that is sadly what I, I almost see so much. Oh, I'm not even going to mess with them. They're so jacked up. They're not worth my time. But love pushes us out of the boundaries of our comfort and of our self-centered nature all the time. In fact, in Scripture, the Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And this is 1 through 7. You may have heard this a time or two before, but this is what he said about love. He said this. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Here's what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Give God praise. Amen. So this morning... Um, I want us to stand today, and as we close today, I just want you to know this. People come to know about Jesus not through a bumper sticker or a slogan. People come to know about Jesus because of his love reaching out to them in their lives. And so today, the challenge is this, is that are you willing to go where he leads you. The challenge today is this. Are you willing to set yourself aside and to love people more than you love yourself? And if I would remiss and say that this is an easy thing to preach, I want to say it's hard and it's, it challenges me. But I know this. If Jesus himself sets the example, should we not follow? Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a moment today. Dear Heavenly Father,
Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Lord, we sense this word, I think, speaking to us here today. Lord, I feel your Holy Spirit working within my heart, within my life. And Lord, I, I, I desire to be more like you. And my prayer is that we all join in on that course of saying, Lord, we want to be more like you. We want to be more like you. If I was to echo the words of a song that we sang this morning, I would want to say that we would want our hearts and our, our, our minds and our entire beings just to be set on fire for you. To where we can't control what happens because you're the one in control. To where we don't contain because you're the one who will lead and guide us where we need to go. And that the greatest place that we could ever be is in your presence that leads and guides to follow the glory cloud of wherever you may be taking us. So Lord, today within this message, Lord, I just ask that you help us to learn to look at the sides of the roads of wherever we're at. Hurting people are all around. Help us be sensitive to their needs. Help us to be able to eloquently speak. And sometimes, Lord, the prayer isn't that we speak, but maybe the prayer is that we listen. We listen more than what we speak. Help us to love people more than what we love ourselves. We pray this in the name of Jesus, all God's people said. Amen. 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 Well, this morning, the benediction is very simple. I ask that the Lord bless you where you're at, and I ask that you learn to look at the sides of the road and see who the Lord may have for you to work and to minister to. You guys are dismissed this morning. Praise God.